Welcome to The Graph Show. I'm Josh Chenevier, and for this episode, I interviewed Dr. Jans Asman, CEO of Franz Inc., makers of Allegro Graph, one of my all-time favorite graph databases on account of its versatility. We'll be talking about property graphs versus RDF. So this is Jans Asman, um, CEO of Franz Inc., uh, makers of Allegro Common Lisp and Allegro Graph. Um, uh, the graph database. Um, I'm Josh Chenevier. I work at Uber um, on uh, uh, data integration and um, uh, standardized schemas. So um, we decided a good topic for today would be um, RDF versus property graphs. Um, Allegro graph being um, an RDF uh, graph database um, since way back. Um, my background is in RDF um, and property graphs as well, um, and I think they both data models have their strengths. Um, those are the um, the two uh, graph data models that are most commonly used for enterprise knowledge graphs. Um, uh, for serious uh, data integration work, I personally recommend RDF, uh, but I think Jans, you can probably um, expand on that quite a bit more. So. Um, if if you uh, if you would uh, give us your thoughts on RDF versus property graphs and why someone might go with an RDF uh, graph database as opposed to uh, a PG database. All right. Well, um, thank you, Josh. And uh, this is the first time, so let's see how this goes. Um, yeah. Well, you can imagine that every time when I do a presentation for a company or when I present present a, a knowledge graph that we've built with or for a customer, then the question I always get is, well, couldn't we have done this with a property graph? And then I have to go into this um, long line of reasoning, and I've, I'm slowly getting to the point where I understand how to explain it. Yeah, And I think the difference between property graph and semantic graph or RDF graph is is mostly a matter of um, culture and discipline. Yeah? It's not so much technological because I can do anything a property graph database can do, theoretically, and a property graph can do anything an RDF graph database can do. Yeah? I mean, that's not so much the issue. And what you also see now is, well, for Allegro Graph, we already for the last five years could add key value pairs to any triple we wanted, so we already had kind of a property graph database. But now we also real soon will have RDF star and sparkle star, yeah, where you can add any any set of uh, um, key value pairs. Well, no, just, just uh, <laughs> metadata on, on a triple. So in that sense, then it would be completely the same, except I would argue that then the RDF triple stores would be even more powerful because property graphs are very limited in the set that that if you look at the attribute values, the values can only be literals. They can't be other nodes. Yeah, so they can't do hypergraphs. But in RDF star, you will have you can do one. You can do one to many. Yeah, so one edge can actually have uh, a, a link to well have multiple attributes with the same name and values. But these values can be other objects yeah, that you can point to. So basically, that model is even way more powerful than the property graph database. And I never understood. Maybe you know. Why they didn't go for that? Why did they keep that limited model? You know, just just literals for attributes. I think it was uh, well, it was reasons for reasons of simplicity. I see property graphs originally as being kind of a reaction to the complexity of of RDF. Um, and not to go off on a tangent right off the bat, but um, uh, maybe you can speak to that as well. Is is adding additional complexity to RDF a good idea? Um, seeing as that's uh, what what developers tend to push back on is the complexity of the standards, um, just the uh, the higher learning curve to getting up to speed on RDF and learn how to uh, you know become fluent in, in RDF tooling. Now we're adding um, uh, uh, statements on statements with RDF star. Is that going to get people into trouble? So that's why I said it's not so much a technical issue. <laughs> it's it's a matter of culture and discipline. You know, if um, so, so the question is, uh, in a company, who's going to decide about what kind of graph database to use? Yeah, and if you give a, a small group of programmers the task, okay, guys, we have this problem here, and it's uh, very much a graph problem. Please go solve it. 
Yeah, and you have three months to do it. Well, then what, what are you going to do as a developer? You're going to take the easiest tool that is to use. Right? You're going to take probably a property graph database that you can program in Java. So you already know Java. Now you can, well, by the way, it could, could be many other languages, but let's say in Java you, and it's very easy to make a node and an edge and off you go. And within three months you have solved your problem. But what you actually have done, you've created a new silo, a new silo or a siloed application in your company. You never thought for one millisecond about, okay, so how is my new application going to work with every other application in my enterprise, yeah? Well, that was not your role. You just got the task to solve this problem. But at the core of the semantic web is that you care deeply about identity of objects, yeah? So you have your enterprise. Enterprise has lots of kinds of entities that are important for you, customers, products, processes. And if you ever want to be able to do real intelligent integration in your company, you have to make sure that you give the same thing the same name. Yeah. So you have to go into the, 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 the trouble and the work of creating a taxonomy of the terms that are important in my business, an ontology, kind of a simple description of the objects that are important for me. Yeah? And if you do that, then you can have people in various places in your enterprise build a, a particular graph around the part of the business that they're responsible for. But because they use the same name for the same thing, you still can add all these, federate all these databases together. And it's something that's really, really hard to explain to people in the property graph world. Yeah, they, they always have this idea, okay, I have to fix, solve a problem. So the people that they need to take a decision about property graph versus a, a semantic graph are not the programmers. It, it is the architects, yeah? people at the highest level that say, okay, are we going to perpetuate this culture of creating a new silo for every new problem? Or are we finally going to take the trouble yeah, of getting a standard within our company um, where we make sure that the customer ID is the same in any database we have yeah, and that this product name is the same in any database that we have? Because once you do that, data integration becomes almost uh, uh, the, the most simple thing in the world. So, but you can't ask programmers to, to, to make that choice. That is the, well, I mean, it happens because you need to have your business problem solved in the next three months, so you choose the easiest tools you can have. But if you're a responsible architect, a CTO, then you're really done, yeah? Then you really, really should think a little bit deeper. And so what I see also, and I, I, I mean it almost like a joke, but all the people that go for the big applications that use semantic graph databases are way over 40. Yeah, because they've seen they've seen the drama of silos, and the young, brilliant young programmers, yeah, they think they can solve anything, and probably they can because they're smart enough, but they never think about the whole implication for the whole enterprise. Yeah, it it's completely, um, uh, yeah. How do I say this? Um, it doesn't even come up in their head. I always make a joke about relational databases. Yeah, when when people make a new relational database, there's not a single neuron in their head. Yeah that is worried about how that relational database is going to work with the relational database there. Yeah. But if you, in the culture of the semantic web, then half the neurons in your, in your head are thinking about, oh God, how is my thing going to work with everything else? Or am I going to make one new application that's going to be pathetically alone? Yeah, because it can't do anything with all the, the other databases in the company. So do you Does think that, that make that, any sense? Yeah, so do you think that that culture can be taught to those in the uh, um, in the property graph um, on the property graph side of things. I've done some work myself on on strengthening this, um, uh, providing a stronger notion of schema uh, for property graphs and for identity. Um, do you think that that culture is is compatible with kind of the the developer culture? I'd say that you know property graph skews more towards. Uh, uh, developers uh, in general and, and RDF historically has come from the academic community, right? So do you think there are lessons that can be learned? Um, in the... uh, you're, well, you're asking almost three different questions in one sentence. Answer any one of them. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> Take your bet. Yeah. So where to begin? So 
What was the first part of your question? That was. Um, so you're talking about the the culture of RDF and how it's it's uh, uh, largely oh, a, a cultural it. yeah. issue as yeah. opposed to a technological issue. I think there's probably both. There are also yeah. technical issues, and maybe we'll we'll have time to get into some of those. What specifically makes property graphs less suited for data integration? Why are they uh, uh, not as strong as on identity and schema? Uh, but I'd like to get to the the cultural issue first. So, do you think there are yeah, things so that uh, we can learn? So to begin with, it's interesting that, but so I talk, so we're trying to sell the semantic graph database and, and then they say, well, but the Neo4j people or the target graph people tell me that they also can do RDF, yeah? So, and you actually see more and more uh, literature where the property graph people try to get into this uh, uh, more the RDF style and about identity. But the issue is that semantic graph database people have already a huge standard, W3C, where all these things are worked out. Yeah. So my prediction is that over 10 years, semantic graph databases will do full property graphs and property graphs will be way, way better at uh, the RDF style of programming. So I think these two worlds grow to each other. But the, the cultural thing is, if, if you... The, the developers will have a really hard time because you have only a limited amount of time to do your project. Yeah, there's no benefit for you to create a taxonomy and ontology. Yeah, only if you're a visionary thinker. I mean, Josh, you are a visionary thinker, so you you really care about it. No, I encounter this issue all the time. Yeah, I, yeah. there are definite long-term advantages to creating. You know, a strong schema, uh, creating a schema with terms that are widely reused uh, throughout our yeah. company. Uh, but you have to kind of push top down to make those things happen because they don't benefit a developer uh, immediately uh, when they're building yeah. one specific application. But Josh, you're, you're in, in a rare case because you, you've been for 10 years in the world of both RDF and property graph databases. And so you know the advantages of both of them. But most of the people, like you just said, don't have that mindset, yeah? They, they don't see why it would benefit them to spend time on a taxonomy. Whereas literally every company that we now work for, yeah, already have worked for years and years on their taxonomies because they know if, if I don't have a taxonomy of all the concepts that are important to me, how can I ever solve the bigger problems that my company have, yeah? I, I, I can do little solutions here and there, but it, I can't solve the bigger problems. So anyway, I mean, that is that enough about the cultural part? I mean, well, let's get to the technical part then. Um, so, uh, what specifically, um, uh, in your words, what um, uh, what problems our developers can run into when they they create a um, you know a property graph database? They're not necessarily thinking about identity. And they're not thinking about ontology. What's the first problem they're going to have when they try to? Uh, put two different uh, data sources together. Well, you're, you're already hitting the, the, the core issue, and that is you have to come up with a convention or a standard for how am I going to name my things, yeah? So I'm, I'm going to build 20 uh, property graph solutions in my company. How am I going to make sure that the customer or the drug name or... Uh, the product is always the same. You need to you really need to have an explicit recording of how you're going to name things. Yeah? That's, the, that's just the first part of the standard. And you can use regular text files or whatever you want to use, but that's really, really a poor way of doing it. I mean, there's standards for how you actually specify that. Yeah? Does that answer your question? I mean, that's, that, that's at the core of it. I mean, yeah, yeah, it does. Um, yeah. Uh, back to kind of the complexity of RDF, there have also, you know, in parallel with efforts to uh, make RDF more expressive, you mentioned RDF star, which uh, appears to be headed toward a new uh, W3C recommendation. Um, there are also efforts to simplify uh, RDF. Do you think that uh, that's something that's, that's necessary? Um, and is that something that you've been thinking about as well? Will there be, you know, RDF uh, 1.2 or so that uh, maybe... Uh, discard some things that are uh, some features that are less um, 
less needed or that just simplifies things? Um, well, let me begin with the complexity and there's two answers to the complexity. One is uh, when the semantic web started, it was very, very academic. Yeah, and we had every year two conferences where several hundred academics needed to publish a paper that did something that no one else had ever done before. So it was all about complex reasoning. And so at some point it got to the level that if you wanted to work with RDF and do any reasoning, then um, uh, you needed an IQ of at least 130. Yeah. <laughs> So I maintain that a person with an IQ of 100 can make beautiful web pages, but you need really to have you really need to be smart if you want to create complex owl ontologies. It's really really complicated. So in the beginning, 80 percent, 90 percent of our potential or real customers were deeply interested in reasoning. Right now, I would say 10 percent of our customers is still interested in reasoning, and then they're usually in life sciences and they have extremely good reasons to use reasoning. But most of the time, for example, think of inverse relationship in OWL. Yeah? I always say that's for lazy programmers, yeah? that you had a test child and now they want to have a, ch a child off too and they don't want to choose, they want to make it automatic. And yes, of course you can have an OWL relationship to say that the, the child off is an inverse or has child, yeah? but you better just choose one of the predicates because your reasoning and, and your, your queries will be slower because the query engine has to do way more work to figure out what, yeah, which, which predicate actually to use. So, but I see, and, and this is very healthy, that at least in the world of RDF, only people that really need reasoning use it. And for the rest, people just use it as a graph. And the only difference that they see primarily to use the, the RDF is because it deals with the identity issue. And so I, I let us it. Now, can RDF be simplified? Um, I mean, so yes, I, I agree. RDF Star and Sparkle Star are currently being developed by multiple vendors, and there's all these really interesting discussions about whether an edge that gets metadata actually is a real edge or just an imaginary edge. Yeah, I mean, so that's not even being solved. Yeah, and, um, and what if RDF allows duplicate triples? So what if you have a duplicate triple and that duplicate triple has um, a meta statement? And well, does it then? RDF, uh, uh, an RDF graph is a set of statements, right? Um, I know that well, a Lego graph does allow duplicate triples. Mm. There's nothing in RDF that allows you, you can say anything you want in the semantic web, so multiple people can say the same thing. You can turn it off, the, the duplicate triple, but some people, well, you can have duplicate triples in multiple graphs. Yeah, that's true. That is true, so you have a duplicate triple, so. <laughs> but by the way, that is a, another, um, that's, that's more a technical advantage, but um, of, of RDF triple stores, but we have this concept of the fourth element of a triple, yeah? And so um, you can cluster groups of triples together, which is a very important property. I even recently even heard from Emil from Neo4j that that would be something that a property graph database also would need, yeah? Because it's very easy in RDF to tell that this group of triples come from a particular file or is belongs to a particular patient, yeah? So if you want to delete all the patient or you want to um, do, do sharding, yeah, then it's incredible useful to have a way to cluster triples together. Yeah, that's something that you see often at the application level and, and something we used to do uh, in Tinkerpop with uh, um, uh, so-called uh, subgraphs, basically just attaching a property um, to all the vertices and or all the edges uh, to mark yeah. them as coming from a particular source. But... Um, so I, I don't want this, uh, I want to keep this video uh, short, but I thought I'd maybe close on another question about just what you yeah. see as um, uh, the future of graphs, you know, graph data models, graph databases, graph applications over the next 10 years, if you have any kind of high level thoughts. The, I, I recently was talking to a Gartner analyst 
and he said internally in Gartner, there's a large group of analysts that think that in about 10 years, graph databases, and kind of independent of property graphs and semantic graphs, right? But the database world will go to graphs and documents, yeah? Because graphs are the way the most flexible way of representing data. I can take a graph and I can model a relational database. I can model a document a database. I can do a key value store, but I can always use a graph as the core mechanism. It's the most granular, uh, flexible system yeah, to, to, to uh, express data. Um, I'm a cognitive scientist. I mean, I was 35 years doing my PhD on uh, uh, modeling human behavior, and I was already using uh, graph structures, and there was no other way that you would even try to model human thinking. Yeah, so, and it's kind of really funny that after all these years to see that now even people at Gartner will say, well, in the end, it will be something like a graph, did, a graph database and document store yeah, that people use to express knowledge. Um, does it mean that there won't be Oracle in 40 years? Well, yes, of course, because we also we still have really weird programming languages around. <laughs> what, what are your thought of, thoughts on the balance between graph databases and relational databases? Will graph databases become as commonplace as relational databases? Um, and along with that, any thoughts on the GQL standard, which is kind of trying to move uh, the property graph data model toward you know something like the SQL standard? Uh, put it on the same footing as SQL. It's probably going to happen. It's probably going to happen. Yes. I, I, I mean, I think that relational databases, and especially the strong uh, asset nature of, of most of the relational databases, is still very, very important in many applications. But for any application where you want to express knowledge, yeah, you will, you will see graph databases. Given that we're in the in the age of knowledge, I mean, I, I mean that's already the answer. Yeah, <laughs> you just cannot express complex knowledge in a relational database. Well, you can, but it's really cumbersome. Yeah. So I, I think that's the answer. We're in, we're in the age of knowledge, and and if you want to express knowledge, this, you can only use graph databases. Sure, sure. I don't see any other answer. So early on in the semantic web, or I guess it peaked around, you know, 2006, 2008 or so was the notion of the giant global graph, as Tim Berners-Lee said, and the, you know, the, the whole linked data uh, movement, which has kind of taken a backseat uh, lately to more, you know, enterprise knowledge graphs and individual um, uh, knowledge bases. Do you think that the giant global graph is something that we'll uh, see again in the future? Um and how do we get there? Well, I always think that the, the, the Wikipedia is already a beautiful global graph. And Wikidata? <laughs> Wikidata, yeah, that's already a, a model of how it could go. Um, I think that using JSON-LD to mark up every product on the planet, every resume every person if, if, if that could happen yeah get more a common json ld structure around every object that we care about that that would inherently already create a global graph the issue is more the big companies yeah what's the incentive to, for the big companies to do this these well, days? well i mean that's what i'm trying to figure out because i mean linkedin has one of the most beautiful graphs on the planet of course because they have all the people that work in all the companies and I even think that governments could change their policies if they had the LinkedIn graph. They know what kind of jobs are needed. They know what kind of what is popular, what is less popular. Um, but I, I don't see LinkedIn make that open source <laughs> knowledge graph and uh, just try to scrape LinkedIn. It's it's almost impossible. And there are uh, privacy uh, implications with that uh, as well, right? There's just of course there's always privacy issues. Um, well, then I mean. Amazon is a beautiful graph, but then they're going to make that uh, available. I mean, um, you guys at Uber have a beautiful graph of movement of people. Yeah. And again, the privacy issue. I'd like to make certain the parts of it public, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's. So we're working not today. with a hospital in the Bronx, uh, Montefiore, and the project leader of that project there is, is working on uh, these 
global graphs of patients. Yeah, what if you every hospital in the world had their own local um, repository of all the patients that they have in a, in a simple format like we do at Montefiore, but then you have a kind of a federation where you can do analytics over all these graphs, yeah, without with without the hospitals giving up the identity of their patient. That would be another. That would be the the healthcare graph, and it would be awesome if all the patients in the world, yeah, could be in this one huge graph without giving up um, privacy. And then of course we have this uh, this recent effort from a Tim Berners Lee. Uh, what's that again? This uh, solid, the? solid. Oh yeah, solid. Yeah, that could be the beginning of a beautiful global graph. Yeah, if you have the social graph in there too. But I mean, it's a real puzzle how you could have a a global graph if 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 there's also the the, the monetary incentives. So I I don't know how that, how that's going to go. I'm yeah, but it's, it, it remains things. a really compelling idea, right? I I still find that compelling oh, the idea of interconnecting as much of human knowledge as we can in a in a giant global yeah. graph so i, I hope we keep working on idea <laughs> everyone could see that yeah the question is how do you get there i agree so that's all for now i hope you enjoyed hearing from jans if you'd like to keep up with future episodes of the graph show subscribe to datageeks.tv